everyone. Um, I am here to tell you how to save the world, or at least survive the year. Uh, my name is Clara Beyer. Hi. Um, I'm a front-end web developer from DC. This is DC. And I was born at King Street Old Town, right down at the bottom. I currently work at Friendship Heights all the way up at the top, so technically Maryland, and I live by between U Street on the yellow green line and DuPont Circle on the red. So if you want to like come to my house, that's a lot of information, but <laughs> <laughs> that DC is very much the world that I grew up in. I have friends who work on the Hill. My parents have worked politics adjacent my whole life. That's very much the angle that I grew up with and decided I rejected. I was like, I don't like politics. It's all phonies with their fundraisers. So I left DC for college, studied linguistics because I thought having a job wouldn't be fun. Um, changed my mind, <laughs> found web development, figured out that having a job is really fun, and sort of thought of myself as a little bit removed from politics. Turns out when you're from DC, your perspective of what removed from politics looks like is what everyone else would call actually very involved and concerned about politics. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you how to save the world because it is the end times. I've actually had to update this presentation because more disasters keep happening. Um, and it's really scary. So here's how to save the world. Also, if you think that everything's A-OK, -okay, um, reevaluate that. But I suppose we are welcoming of all viewpoints. Um, first step is donate all your money. Every Town for Gun Safety is a new addition to this list. But all these guys, Planned Parenthood, National Immigration Law Center, Know Your Nines is doing really great work protecting Title IX and um, sexual violence on college campuses in the face of all kinds of nonsense. ACLU, most of the time, is pretty good. Global giving is great for natural disasters, hurricanes. DCCC, I like, I'm partisan. DC, I'm sorry. Uh, swing left, Southern Poverty Law Center. Let's keep going. Now that all your money's gone, donate all your time. <laughs> Work for Habitat for Humanity or something. I don't know. Punch Nazis, don't really do violence. I read the, the whole code of contact. We're not really doing violence, but if you see a Nazi and they say they're a Nazi, I kind of think go for it. <laughs> Boycott all these guys. Um, Yangling shouldn't be too hard, but <laughs> <laughs> all these guys just don't buy any of their stuff. You don't have any money anyway. You gave it to Planned Parenthood. And L.L. Bean's founder gave money to Trump. Hobby Lobby's stealing artifacts and putting them in museums from ISIS. It's like a whole thing. Uh, Trident gum, it turns out, is also bad. <laughs> just stop having possessions. It's trouble live in the woods. <laughs> so that's one option. Let's walk back from that. <laughs> Let's just talk about taking care of ourselves in this very stressful time, because it is the end times. <laughs> There's this really great game I like to play called Dungeons and Dragons. I play a very sneaky elf who can do a little bit of magic. She has a pet weasel. And it's great. There's a big evil force, but someday I'm going to be strong enough to beat it. Unfollow everyone on Twitter except dog rates because they post <laughs> they post really good dogs. 13 out of 10 dogs. Except you also have to unfollow dog rates. And I'm sorry about that. So just avoid, it turns out other people might still follow people on Twitter, so you've got to avoid anyone with a smartphone. And it also turns out there are other ways to get this information other than from Twitter. So just cut out all your friends who Follow the world and the goings on around them. Live in the woods. So here, we're, here we are, that's my plan. So here we've got Thoreau, and here we've got Aristotle. Thoreau, naturally, loves living <laughs> in the woods. Aristotle had a concept that is useful some of the time, which is the golden mean, saying that essentially if you have two options, the best is the one in the middle. So if you have too much bravery, you're reckless. If you have not enough, you're a coward. You should be the right amount of brave. And that's 50% brave, according to Aristotle. Sort of philosophy has moved past it, but we're going we're gonna to pick Aristotle on this one. So 
here is how to do something in the middle. Approximately 11 months ago, the 2016 election happened. I was a Hillary fan, like really ride or die about that. I drove up to Pennsylvania to knock on doors in Bucks County. It was awesome. I really recommend canvassing for everyone. It's a great thing to do and it gets you out in pleasant weather and usually the fall is pretty nice. Um, and I was totally blindsided by Donald Trump's victory. I just knocked me off my feet. And one of the things that being in DC that I just like couldn't get my head around was like, what do I do? And how can I do good in this situation? And to be fair, my first reaction was actually to cry a lot on the metro, at work. I had just started a new job like a month prior and I'm just like tears coming down my face in my open office plan. It was a whole thing. And they didn't fire me. They took us all out for McFlurries. We had a great time. But so I'm going to put in a plug here for the first thing you need to do in reaction to a crisis is not immediately get on your feet unless you are literally a first responder, in which case that is what you should do. You should not process it. Um, but I'm going to put in a plug for this is the metro I cried on. Uh, I'm going to put in a plug for taking that time to emotion about things that are going on. Uh, William Wordsworth, one of my favorite poets, has this quote that I always love. Poetry takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Um, I think this applies to a lot of things other than poetry. And I would say effective projects that are emotionally driven, you sort of have to give yourself that time to feel it and really go hard in feeling it so that you can take the next step of making something from it. This presentation has swearing. Uh, this is what I made from that emotion. It was a site called holyfucktheelection.com. It took the holy fuck feeling and tried to help direct people to ways that they could either contribute financially or volunteer towards the causes that they were most fucking losing their shit about. <laughs> so, it was very cathartic for me to make and very cathartic for people to find, click on, share. It channeled a lot of the just like panic <laughs> that I was feeling and that a lot of people that I knew were feeling. And my major goals at the time, I was learning React. I completely over-engineered this. I used Redux. I really didn't need to. But <laughs> it was something that I wanted to learn and I didn't really know what was going to be an appropriate use of it until I got to know it better. I wanted to use a lot of swear words because that was the emotional state I was at at the time. And I wanted to get people to pay attention to organizations that were already doing really, like Southern Poverty Law Center has been out there for a really long time just doing great work. And in the wake of the election, I sort of, I'm going to get a little bit on this later, but there's sort of an impulse to do something yourself. And sometimes the best thing is to help the people who are already doing it and use what you can do to just shine a spotlight at that. So I make web toys in my spare time because they can be really useful. I saw some great feedback from one of the best things I saw from Holy Fuck the Election was a tweet from a guy at the Environmental Climate Law Justice, those were the words, I probably put them in the wrong order, but saying that they were getting a lot of traffic to their donation page from this. And that just felt awesome that like their donations were actually up because I had sent people to do that. It's so much more fun than getting a lot of retweets, which is also really, really fun. Uh, so they're useful, they're really fun, and programming is really fun. Like I love to program. And that is one of the skills I have that feels like it's a useful one to have. So, I mean, I'm in a room of people who are pretty much on board with the idea that programming is fun. So, your powers. How to use them for good and not evil or stupid. <laughs> Don't do that. There are so many better ways to spend your time than making a $700 juice machine. Uh, I really feel like this is on the theme for what's going on so far. 
So the way that I consider my web toys, and the way that I can, because I do them in my spare time, I do them outside of my job. I love my job, but it gives me a lot of the space and tools that I need to come home and do these things. So I can think of them as art. And art is so fun, because poetry takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility, and web toys can be art. And I'm sort of of that new age opinion that anything can be art if you sort of decide that it is. And that's within my rights to do so. And it's within your rights if you so choose. So you've got to find inspiration. And for me, a lot of the time lately, my inspiration has been a horrific event or something really scary or something that makes me really mad or, you know, what do you do with the bad feelings that you feel? <laughs> And that is something to just sort of, I have a radar out for like, oh, I'm, I'm having this reaction. Maybe there's something I can do with this. So Kim Kardashian tweeted this interesting graph after Donald Trump announced his effective Muslim ban, um, pointing out the statistics, uh, some data you can use of how likely it is that you're going to be killed by Islamic jihadist immigrants. And it's really unlikely, y'all. So I thought that's kind of cool. Like that's good for Kim Kardashian. I'm team Taylor Swift in that whole thing, but, <laughs> but like good for her using her platform in a really positive way. So I noticed that this was data from the CDC and I found the same data set and created this, which is yourcauseofdeath.com. You go to it and it tells you how you died this is just one of many causes of death that you could end up with. And then it points out your chances of dying in a terrorist attack by an immigrant Muslim extremist are incredibly, incredibly low. I checked Google Analytics that I had set up on this page. No one so far who has used this site has gotten that result. It is technically in there, but it's just frighteningly unlikely. And this is just a random number generator that makes a point and makes people think about mortality. So that's kind of fun. Um, so this was another just small toy. This took me like a couple days to throw together and people liked it and it's like fun to do. So the next part, once, you're, once you've got your inspiration, you've got to know your tools and how you're going to do this. So these are some of the tools that I use. I use a lot of stuff, obviously, uh, front end, so HTML, CSS, JavaScript, love those things. The ones I really want to call out for how useful I find them and how underrated I think they are are Glitch. How many of y'all know Glitch? Awesome. How many of y'all know CodePen? Same people? Okay. If you know CodePen and you don't know Glitch, CodePen for front end is Glitch for full stack node applications. Glitch is really, really cool. It's a web UI for deploying things like coding, live, it, just, it sets up all this stuff. So if you're like, I kind of have an idea, I'm gonna put like 40 minutes into it and see if it goes anywhere. You don't have to spend those whole 40 minutes setting up Webpack. So that's awesome. And Netlify is sort of like GitHub pages on steroids. I'm really, really into it. Their free tier has always had everything I've wanted to do with it. It just makes deploying front-end only static sites really, really easy. And again, I'm just about not having to do a lot of setup. If something takes too long or gets boring, I'll go home and play Minecraft. Um, and then Google Spreadsheets, I use all the time when I don't want to set up a database. You can just publish a Google Spreadsheet as JSON and just consume it. That's how your cause of death works, is it's just a couple Google spreadsheets published to the web and then had stuff done with them. So I love all these things. I think they're really useful. But that's me. That's my field anyway. So for whatever your individual skill set is, you have a set of tools that make you happy, that make you feel comfortable, that get you excited, that you feel like you totally know what you're doing in and use that. Or be like me with Redux and use it as an excuse to teach yourself a new thing that you wouldn't necessarily want to try out for the first time in a work situation or something. Like, I don't care what you use. Do something. <laughs> don't let 
not knowing the right stack stop you, but also use the stack that you like the best. That's the whole point, it's art. But there's also strategy. So one of the things that I have wanted to do since I was a little girl was outrank my great-grandmother on Google. <laughs> my great-grandmother, Clara Mortensen Beyer, was a labor expert. She worked with FDR. She was friends with Frances Perkins. She was an incredibly cool woman. I'm very proud to be named after her. But I just had this feeling that like, when you Google Clara Beyer, it should be me. <laughs> I'm Clara Beyer. <laughs> and in 2013, I made it happen. And I was very, very proud of myself. So I made a Twitter account called Feminist Taylor Swift that, this is before I was coding at all. This is just a pure, like, I wrote all the tweets um, where I took Taylor Swift lyrics, made them feminist, and sent them out into the world. In 2013, it was a lot more fun to be a feminist. So there was kind of more to go on, but I got written up in the Washington Post and got like 100,000 followers in a couple weeks and it was really insane and I was a college student and it was this crazy whirlwind. I thought I was writing a book, I stopped, it was wild. But that was my first like really thrown into the deep end experience of having something catch on and what that means and what it takes to make that happen. Because I have a lot of projects that no one cares about. <laughs> I'm trying to hit next, but it doesn't want me to. There we go. Here's the recipe for viral success that everyone's been hiding from you. 80% passion. You've got to care about what you're doing. You've got to have the emotion that you're recollecting in tranquility. 45% um, is consistent commitment to the bit. For feminist Taylor Swift, my bit was it was Taylor Swift lyrics. I was being feminist. If I had some tweet that wasn't those things, that would be really weird. Um, for holy fuck the election, it was swearing. You gotta have swearing if your whole thing is you're swearing. 60% is reaching people where they have something that they're already looking at. Um, so if you're Kim Kardashian, you don't have to do this part because you're Kim Kardashian and you can just tweet a screenshot of a graph from the CDC. Um, but if you are me, you've gotta use colors and flashy, language and mortality. You know, people love mortality. So that is something where you sort of got to think about like, what's my hook? Why, why should people care? Why am I not just bumming people out? Especially now because people have a lot to be bummed out about. And then it's 130% chance. Um, I'm a statistician, so I know that these are real numbers. <laughs> so William Wordsworth, known basketball fan. <laughs> he, famously said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. He said that actually to Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> and I, also a basketball fan, have known, I've been known to say, no one cares about a, probably at least 90% of the stuff you do. So that's just part of it. Like, I have made so many things that I've either not even bothered to tell people about because I didn't finish them. I had this great plan for a Scaramucci cross-stitch quote maker. And as I was like halfway through, he got fired. And I was like, this isn't fair. This <laughs> seems like they're conspiring against me. But like, that's just part of it. And that's why passion is so important is that because I like what I'm doing and I care about what I'm doing, it doesn't feel like wasted time. Um, but you've got to just accept that, that like, it's not always going to work. And you've got to have more ideas in the chamber and not let that discourage you. Um, but it's all well and good if you get the attention. But what are people going to do with that? With the attention that you have pulled in from the world, getting people to do something. So, and that's easier than ever now because people are more scared <laughs> and people are I think realizing that all is not well in a lot of ways and wanting to be more involved and wanting to feel like they're contributing and it feels good uh, like my friend has this rule where if we are chatting on Facebook she cannot say bad things about Donald Trump 
until she gives money to Puerto Rico. <laughs> like, every day she does this, and she has the money to do that, so, you know, if, if that would put too much financial strain on her, that's, it's per person how you sort of get that, but that is her good feeling. She's like, I need to, before I go fully into negativity, I need to prove that I'm helping. And that's a lot of what I try to do with my web tools is like, it makes me feel good to point people in those directions. Um, as I touched on earlier, there is sort of a political not invented here syndrome where, like we've all seen this in tech where you want to use a tool and someone's like, well, it doesn't quite do exactly what we want. So let's instead spend like six months building our own version that doesn't work as well. And, or maybe yours works great, I don't know. But we get the same thing in activism where you think, I haven't started any charities recently, so there aren't any, uh, but there are, and people are doing really awesome things, and if you look hard and you do the research, and Charity Navigator is great for that, also they have really good uh, reporting of how people spend their money. It is worth looking into whether someone is already doing what you are trying to get people to do, and if you can partner with them, help them out, collaborate, work together, love those things. Um, some things you can ask people to do once you've got their attention is donate money, donate goods, you know, canned food, clothes, anything you've got, paper towels is a thing now. Um, <laughs> you can ask people to make phone calls. Uh, fivecalls.com is a really great example of this. They literally, very straightforward pitch, please make five phone calls. Here are your members of Congress, here are your senators, here are the issues that we would like you to call them about, here are their numbers, five calls. Super obvious. Another one that uh, Holy Fuck the Election very much is inspired by was yourfuckingpollingplace.com. It just told you your fucking polling place. <laughs> <laughs> and it's way more fun than going to your local Board of Elections website and like trying to go through that whole thing. Um, asking people to post on social media can be helpful. I put an asterisk by it because there are, there is a word that is, that I don't like called slacktivism, where people get credit for helping something when really they're just talking about helping something. I sometimes fear that I am doing this and so I make a point to also be giving money and giving time to these causes. But if you're asking people to post on social media that like something everyone already knows, it doesn't really help. But if you're calling attention to an issue that people don't know about and that's part of the problem, um, I see a lot of this, and it's a real bummer that I see a lot of this, but I see a lot of this when like trans women are getting murdered and when I see tweets saying like, hey, another trans woman was murdered, that's a big problem. It's something that isn't being covered by the media that I usually follow. So it's really good that people are getting out there on Twitter saying like, this is important, this is a big problem, we need to spread this knowledge so that we can begin to do something about it. So that's when so posting on social media is really helpful when it's an underrepresented issue. Um, asking people to learn about local elections is great. Virginia has a governor's race really soon. If any of y'all live near Virginia, come knock on doors with me. Um, ask people to volunteer, and then you can ask people to take a break, hang out. Holy fuck, the election has a whole section of I'm de freaking out, and then it just shows you pictures of puppies, and that's great too. <laughs> you gotta take care of yourself. And then here are places that you can tell people to donate all their money. <laughs> and what you get out of it is it feels good, it's fun, it helps the world, you're saving the world a little bit, the right amount, according to Aristotle. When your great grandkids grow up, they will try to outrank you on Google, which we all have pretty solid web presences, I would bet, so they're already gonna have some real complexes. And if anyone does this, I will send you pictures of my cat. He, I promise, tweeted at me and I will send you a picture of my cat in response. So, that's what to do. Thank you guys so much.